Chapter 7. It seemed hours, but it was probably only a little bit of time. Until Timothy said, Don't be alarmed now, young bass. I'm going to jump in the water and kick this raft off the shore. Without that, we pass by the island by and by. In a moment, I heard a splash on one side of the raft, and then Timothy... His feet began drumming the water. I guess he was not afraid of sharks this close in. Soon he yelled, Bottom, young boss, ya bottom! His feet touched the sand. In a few minutes, the raft lurched, and I knew we had touched ground. I listened for the sounds from the shore, hoping there would be a cheerful, Hello! But there was nothing. Just the wash of the low surf around the raft. Timothy said, Here, young boss, on my shoulders, and I'll fetch you to the island. He helped me onto his back. I said, Don't forget Stu Cat. He laughed back heartily. One at a time, young boss. And with that, on me, with me on his back, he splashed ashore. Judging from the time it took, the raft wasn't very far out. Then he lifted me down again. Blan! He shouted. The warm sand did feel good on my feet, and now I was almost glad we wouldn't have to spend another night on that stupid hard wood, wet woods at boards of the raft. He said, touch it, young boss. Feel the land. Tis outrageously good. I reached down, and the grains of sand felt fine, almost like powder. To me, he said, tis a beautiful gay, this gay. Never have I seen this gay. Then he led me to sit under a clump of bushes. He said, You do us easy while I pull the raft more out of the water. We mustn't not lose it. So I sat there in the shade, running sand through my fingers, wondering where among all the many islands in the Caribbean we were. Timothy shouted up from the water, Many fish here, oh, langosta, too. I know I be, we, we be roasting them. Langosta, I knew, was a native lobster. The one without claws. I heard Timothy splashing around down by the surf, and I knew he was pulling the raft up as far as he could get it. A moment later, puffing hard, he flopped down beside me and said, Oh, catch my be breath. Then I tour the island and select a good place for camp. He set Stu Cat in my lamp. Camp? I asked, st stroking Stu Cat. Timothy replied, We may be here two or three days. We be living comfortable. I could tell, I was, he could tell I was discouraged because we had come to the island and now there was no people on it. He said confidently, We better ask you to be sure before the night I built a, a great fire, pile of brush and, and wood, so the next aircraft fly over and we set it off. Where are we, Timothy? Near Panama? He answered slowly, mm, It cannot be very sure, young boss. Not very sure. But you knew about the banks and the caves and the, near the banks. I wonder if he knew anything. But really, he just, or if really he was just a stupid old black man. Timothy said, listen, I know that many banks and caves are around here about 15 north and 80 long. There are Conda, De Cernado, Quinto, Siniero, and Cernilla, and Rolezanda, and then there is the Beacon, or the Beacon, and North Cay, off to the west somewhere in Providencia, in the San Andres. He paused for a moment and then said, Far way up there, I think, is the Caymans, and then Jamaica. But you're not sure of this island? Timothy answered gravely, True. I'm not sure, young boss. Do the Schooners usually come this close here, I asked. Again, gravely, Timothy said, The man who fishes follow the fish. Certainly there fish here. I be seeing it with my own self eyes. I kept feeling that Timothy was holding something back for me. It was the tone of his voice, and I heard my father talk that way a few times. When he didn't want me to tell my grandfather what was about to die or when he didn't tell me about the car that ran over my dog in Virginia. Of course, both times happened when I was younger. Now my father was always very honest with me. I thought because he said that in the end that was better, better anyway, so I wish Timothy would be honest with me. Instead, he got up to take a walk around the K. 
Finally, he'd be back in a few minutes. Then Stu Cat wandered away. I called out to him, but it seemed to be exploring the island, too. Realizing I was alone on the beach, I became frightened. I knew now how helpless I am. Was with, I was without Timothy. First, I began calling for Stu Cat, but when he didn't return, I began shouting for Timothy. There was no answer. I wondered if he'd fallen down or was hurt. I began to crawl along the beach and ran head into a clump of low-hanging brush. I sat down again, battling at gnats that were buzzing around my face. Something brushed against my arm, and I yelled out in terror, but I heard the meow, and then I knew it was Stu Cat. I reached for him and held him tight until I heard the brush crackling, and I sang out, Timothy? Yes, young boss, he called back from quite a distance. When we were closer, I said harshly, you never leave me alone again. Do you hear me? Never again. He laughed. <laughs> there's nothing to fear here. I walked around the whole island, and there's nothing but sea grip, sand, a few little lizards, and a dozen poem. I repeated, never leave me alone, Timothy. All right, young boss, I promise, I promise. He said, he must have been looking all around, for he said, no water here. But tis no problem. We have the water keg, and we'll be making a trap mount for the first rain. Still believing he wasn't telling me everything, I said, you were gone a long time. He answered un un uneasily, oh, 30 minutes at the most. The island is about one mile long and a half wide. It's shaped like the melon. I found a place to make our camp near the poem. It will be a good place for looking up. The rise about 40 from the sea. I nodded and said, I'm hungry, Timothy. We were both hungry. We went back to the raft, took out the keg of water, the tin and the biscuits and the chocolate. While we were eating, I said, you are worried about something, Timothy. Please tell me the truth. I'm old enough, you know, to know. Timothy waited for a long time answering, probably trying to find the right words. Finally, he said, Young boss, that is this part of the sea, a few little caves like this one, surrounded on both sides by homebone banks. They are cut off from the rest of the sea and by these banks. I tried to make a mental picture that several small islands tucked up inside the great banks of the coral might navigation dangerous, which was why I finally decided on, so you think we're on one of these caves? Maybe, young boss, maybe. Fear coming back to me, I knew we had made a mistake coming ashore, and I said so. Then no ships will even pass by. Not even schooners. We're trapped here. We might live here forever, I thought. Again, he did not answer me directly. I was beginning to learn that he had a way of being honest while still being dishonest. He said, eh, The place I am thinking is called Devil's Mouth. Tis you shaped thing. With the sharp coral banks and on either side running maybe 40, 50 mile. Then he let that sink in. That sounded bad. But then he said, I do hope, young boss, that I am outrageously mistaken. If we are in the devil's mouth, how can we be rescued? I answered, asked angrily. It was his fault that we were here. Oh, the fire pile. When the aircraft fly over, they will see the smoke and they will see the fire. But they might just think it's native fishermen and no one else would come here. I could picture him nodding and thinking about that. Finally, he said, true. But we cannot fret about it, can we? We'll make the camp and we'll see what happens. He poured me half a cup of water, saying happily, since we have made land, we can celebrate. I drank it slowly and thoughtfully. <laughs>